Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, good day, good whatever it is, whenever it is you're catching this. Uh, Welcome to another Road Reflections. This is Chris Mohan here, coming in from inside my vehicle to yell at you guys about some stuff. Uh, A few announcements up at the top. Uh, New show on Friday, October 16th. Or, yeah, October 16th, I believe, is... Uh, is the date, that's the Friday, it's, uh, uh, that's gonna be the last Citizen Revolution for a little bit, you guys. So, a couple things with that. First and foremost, um, I was recording at the, uh, River's Edge studio, and that studio is no longer going to be available, um, due to, uh, you know, it's, it's housed within a venue, and the venue can't afford to keep that space around anymore. Uh, due to COVID, because they're not really doing a lot of shows there, so, uh, you know, COVID difficulties means no studio, uh, and that kind of sucks, but that's okay, uh, because I, I think now is a good time to take a little bit of a hiatus from the show, I've pretty much been doing it every single week, um, pretty much doing some kind of show for every single week, since this pandemic started, I, I, I didn't really take time to decompress or stop or anything. Um, and I always feel guilty when I take days off. Like, I, I think I took, like, the 4th of July off. Uh, and I felt I felt weird about that. Just That's just how my brain operates. But um, I've gotten to that point with the show where I do, I do think, like, I'm, I'm a little bit burnt out. Um, and it's not like I hate doing the show, uh, but you know, every week I like, first of all, I'm the only person on staff on the show and it's, it's, it's a, it's a pretty, uh, pretty large undertaking. I think some of you might, some of you might know that some of you might not know that some, you know, I, I do think that the people that have come to see the show and, and have experienced what it is and what I'm, what I'm putting together and how I'm putting it together probably know, uh, what kind of undertaking it is, um, because I'm doing all the research, and there's a lot of research, you know, it's anywhere from eight to 12 hours of research, I'm doing all the writing, which is like a full day's worth of writing for these scripts, uh, they tend to get anywhere between, um, eight and, uh, eight and, like, 15 pages, depending on, depending on the script, and then I have to, like, gather all of my sources, um, and build little video clips and, and build, you know, uh, screen caps so, so you know where I'm getting this information from. Um, and then uh, from there, wow, these guys are assholes here. But from there, I, I would build the show out. I would build a presentation for the show and then go and do it. So it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort uh, to put into a show like this from one person on a weekly basis and I was doing okay with it um and you know like for for the time being it was like okay I'm 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 able to pay some bills I'm I'm well kind of sort of but not really because I was giving half of it to uh a grassroots uh organization non-profit grassroots organization like movements for a people's party uh Hardlands Media Action for Assange you know, a couple of mutual aids. Uh, I gave half the ticket sales to them, and that was fine because I had a bunch of my bills like deferred, and I was still making enough, and I was still putting enough away that, you know, when time came, I would be able to adjust what I needed to adjust and go from there. So, but it got to a point where like every single week, I am, I was excited about the show, but dreading the work that goes into the show. Like once it came to showtime, I was excited, but. Like, the rest of the time, I was just really, I was, I was tired, I would, you know, like, if I, if I was off by a day, or, like, I had to do some extra research or something, like, it would throw my week off, and I, you know, I would kind of get a little panicky about certain things, or, um, I, you know, I would, I would drop the ball on, on sending my email list, or I would drop the ball on, like, releasing a video, or I would miss a big story or something, like, and I would get a little panicked about it. That's, that's, you know, that's sort of the reality. But that's, that's sort of, I think, I realized, like, I am, I think I am burning out on the show. Like, putting together the show, putting myself into that stress mode is, 
not particularly doing me any favors. So, taking a little bit of a step back, uh, Friday, October 16th, I'm going to do a little Halloween show, going to tell a couple stories, uh, make it a nice, relaxed evening, um, and, uh, and then I'm going to take off for a while. I don't know exactly how long. Uh, I do have a couple shows that I'll have like as makeup shows. So people, if you did, if you did order a ticket to like my birthday show or the makeup show on November 7th, um, I'll probably, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be just be giving out free tickets to you guys when the show comes back for the first two shows. Uh, and you know, there'll be an email sent out. Uh, so if you're not on my email list, you should join up on my email list. That is, uh, important and it's a good way to keep up with all the things that I'm doing because, uh, you know, YouTube, Facebook censorship, or you can join me on Rockfin. That way you don't miss any videos on Rockfin. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's sort of the, the situation. I'm, I'm going to take that time to, uh, to, to essentially relax a little bit. Uh, get caught up on a few projects that I haven't been able to catch up on. Um, I will still be doing Taboo Table Talks. There will still be episodes of Forkful of Noodles that were pre-recorded from past Citizen Revolutions coming out. Uh, You know, um, after November, I'm I'm about eight weeks ahead. So I've got eight weeks worth of episodes that that will come out. Um, And hopefully by that time, I would have figured out how to uh, convert the space that I'm in now you know, like just like a home studio could convert a space in, in, in my home into a home studio and uh, come back feeling better, come back feeling stronger about the show, um, you know, be, be a little bit more adjusted to a schedule because I do have a couple side gigs that I had to take in order to like supplement more income and stuff. Um, and if you want to help out in, in, in a, on the financial end of things, uh, you know, the best way to do that is by either becoming a sustaining member or making a one-time donation, if you can, if you can. It's not a necessity. It's not mandatory or anything. A bunch of my stuff is always going to be available for free, but outside of a paywall, that is. Uh, so that's an if-you-can kind of situation. Um, so again, you can go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com, for all of those details. Uh, that is actually one of the projects that I will be sprucing up while, uh, while I take a little, little sabbatical from the show. Um, anyway, I have three topics of discussion today. I I originally was only going to do two, but then I remembered I wanted to do this third one. Uh, the first one is, I got to talk about this, man. I think the last couple of years we've, we've, uh, I've, I've, I've only caught snippets of SNL. And SNL always... I mean, they're not like a, a major political satire, satire show. They're a, a sketch comedy show. And uh, they're a mediocre sketch comedy show at best. At this point, right? Like, they've had some pretty legendary people uh, on that show. Uh, Steve Martin, Dan Aykroyd, Eddie Murphy, Jim um, Jim Carrey, Will Ferrell, like, D- Daryl Hammond, um, you know, uh, Rachel Dratch. Maya Rudolph, Amy Poehler, Tina... F- I mean, uh, the list goes on for but the amount of fucking legendary, amazing people that they've had on that show. But I would say in the last couple of years, they've really dropped the ball on any sort of political satire content. Anything that leans political in any way uh, has been trash. It's been trash. Uh, they tried to, like, last year they tried to satirize... Like, they ignored Tulsi Gabbard for the most part. Um, and then when they did, they made her into Cruella DeVille, which doesn't make any fucking sense. And it goes to show that the writers aren't really paying attention uh, to, to you know, even the mainstream of the political topics that they talk about. Because the mainstream of the political topic that Tulsi Gabbard was talking about was anti-war stuff. And you can't do anti-war stuff, even in a joking way, on a network like fucking NBC. So, you know, it just... They, they're, they're trash, man. They're trash. And I think the debate sketch and uh, the, the VP debate sketch from uh, the last couple weeks were fucking terrible. They were terrible. Like, I, I, like they didn't even... You know, like, the, maybe the one good joke that they had from the VP debate was 
and they and they kind of did this with the with the presidential debate too. Uh, oh, I don't. Uh, Trump Trump said something like, "I don't. I'm not going to wear a mask, and I don't see that biting me in the ass later that week." Uh, and then they had something uh, in the VP debate where they said, uh, "Oh, we have the two vice presidential candidates. Uh, who these two humans will be the biggest news for the next 24 hours?" Or, and it was just like, "Yeah, okay, cool. Like you played off of that, and, like." And they did like obvious fly references that were memes. Like they, they they did memes as jokes. What the fuck? But that's kind of expected, right? Because they're not they're not really going to. They're not satirists, and they're not really good political comedians on that show. Not anymore, anyway. Uh, I think, you know, during the Bush-Gore era, during, during like, the Clinton era, during Daddy Bush era, like, they were doing some pretty, like, good, hard-hitting political stuff, but Lauren Michaels is a rich guy. Why would a rich guy fucking talk to to power against people that, that are his, like, friends? And I think part of the thing of like hit, like the whole like hammering the Donald Trump thing is because around close to the election in 2016, Donald Trump hosted SNL. Like they let him fucking host SNL. I hope some people haven't forgotten that because they've they've done some vehemently anti-Trump stuff, but they fucking let him host SNL and they like gave him a bunch of free airtime. Like, it's, that was insane. So, recently Bill Burr hosted SNL, right? And it was like a big dream. Like, every comic that goes on there. I think maybe Dave Chappelle was the only one that didn't go up there and be like, this has been my dream. I think it was my dream when I was fucking 10. And then I grew up and I was like, I don't, fu- I don't want to, no. No thanks, I'm good. I've heard enough stories about fucking SNL. So he does his thing, and you know, Bill Burr is Bill Burr. There, there, he talks. Sometimes he talks about some edgy stuff. Sometimes he just he's gonna say some controversial shit because he knows it's controversial shit. It's kind of what he does. It's kind of his thing. And look, I like Bill Burr. Uh, I, I to I, to be a little bit more frank, I know I've kind of criticized a couple of his. Uh, well, one of his specials. Uh, that kind of took people by storm. He had a black and white special that came out a couple years ago. Uh, best special he's put out. No doubt. It was like personal. It hit political uh, topics, sociopolitical topics pretty well. Um, even stuff that I didn't disagree with wasn't like, oh, ooh, what the fuck? Like, why would you say something like that? But he's veered into that, like, wait, why would you say something like that? Territory. Right? He's kind of gone into that territory a lot more. So, in the monologue, which is a short monologue, it's like, I don't know, seven, eight minutes, something like that, uh, he opens up with, uh, wear a mask or don't wear a mask, I don't care. If you want to kill grandma, you can kill grandma. We have too many people on this planet. And it's like, okay, cool, thanks, Edgelord. Like, yeah, like... Let's let's talk about just the, decimating the population of the planet. Are there too many people on the planet? Yeah, okay. Maybe we should stop fucking for procreation for a little while, right? Like, there's enough enough kids that you can adopt if you want to be a parent or whatever. Like, I get it, but all right. But he was just like, yeah, kill grandma, whatever. I don't give a shit, whatever. Fuck off. Like, it's like, hey, do you really want? do you really want this fucking thing to spread around? Because that's the implication right there. You understand that this is an infectious disease and not just like any infectious disease. Like it's one of the most infectious diseases on the planet. So then he like goes on to talk about white women and he starts trashing white women and he's done this on the special before. He, he trashed white women. Uh, how they co-opt the movement, right? The the Black Lives Matter movement, the defund the police movement. They co-opted the movement and they threw on their Gucci bags. I was like, oh, you're not talking about white women. You're talking about rich white women. But you can't say rich white women because now Bill Burr is a little rich. Bill Burr has some money. 
So he's just going to be edgy and kind of populate everybody. It's like, yeah, there's there's white people as allies to the fucking Black Lives Matter movement. Good. There's a lot of them that are not making it about themselves. The loud ones are. Some of the more ritzy, I need to be in the public eye ones. Sure, yeah. It's misinformation through comedy. Or for the sake of disparaging a particular group. And it's I think it's unfair because it's like, no, these movements need allies as well as the core group. You know, like I think instead of separating each other into this is the, where like it's it's this weird separate but equal kind of way of saying I support the movement, but I'm going to stay here in this little circle. It's like, no, if you want to go to a protest, if you want to uh, like share and amplify information if you want to put your money where your mouth is and and donate to some uh you know uh poc groups some some poc creative outlets and things of that sort then then yeah go i highly encourage that sort of stuff don't make that about you don't make it about like look at how great i am And, and a lot of people aren't doing that But he just bulks everybody into that. And it's like, what the fuck, man? Are, are we not over this, like, hyper-generalization in comedy? Like, that's the only fucking way that you can make things funny is by hyper-generalizing it. And then he does this, like, hacky fucking premise of, like, oh, June's Gay Pride Month. Oh, I didn't know it was Gay Pride Month. But they got a whole month... It's like, yeah. Oh, black people only got February. They got the coldest, shortest month. And it's like, okay, yeah. But what's it? And he's like, oh, you should give black people June. Okay, they kind of do have that. It's called Juneteenth. Everybody didn't know about fucking Juneteenth until fucking Donald Trump made a big thing out of it with Tulsa. How'd you miss that, Billy B? <laughs> I did a video about it because I was like not enough people fucking know about this and Texas approved it as a state holiday but Congress has not they have not approved it as a federal holiday it should easily be a federal holiday June just celebrates the emancipation some people call it the second independence day that's in June you could have done that you could have used the platform of SNL to amplify what Juneteenth was to amplify how that is a valid holiday that we should all celebrate. Fuck Christopher Columbus Day. Celebrate Juneteenth. It's this very weird, like, let's pit black people against gay people type shit. Uh, Like this weird oppression Olympics type shit. And it's very, very, very annoying. Like, I hate it. I hate the oppression Olympics stuff. I've never cared for it. Um, you know, and that's what that's what he's doing. He's, he's like, black people should have this month. And how about this? How about this? How about instead of, like, having to give people a month, how about, how about we don't be dicks to people who choose to love who they want to love or have a different skin color than you? How about that? How about we just live our lives that way? How about we don't, like, it's not like we, the the reason why we have to make it a big deal is because we fucked up so many times. (laughs) It's just so tone deaf. So tone deaf. But this is what mainstream comedy ends up being. You know, it ends up being this tone deaf thing and, you know, and then a bunch of fucking open micers will start being like, I want to be like Bill Burr. I want to do that kind of jokes. I'm edgy. No, Bill Burr's not even being edgy. 
So, all right, boy, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on here. But uh, the second topic I wanted to talk about was so I read this article. Uh, Glenn Greenwald put this article up about uh, why why there's a, a liberal backlash to Joe Rogan. Um, and it's a it's a really well written article. I, I suggest you go check it out. But he points out a couple things. Like first of all, Joe Rogan has this like huge platform on YouTube. Right, like where we're at minimum, at the least, he gets five million views. Right, that's like l- at the least. That's what some Fox News and MSNBC videos get maximum. Right, they get a maximum of five billion views on YouTube. This guy's built an empire all by himself, a solo empire, and you know some of the bigger mainstream corporate outlets are getting like. They're, they're getting a fraction of the views that he normally gets. Like the Edward Snowden interview from last October got like 16 million views, right? It's like an incredible amount of views. A lot of people go to Joe Rogan uh, because he brings on people that are interesting or brings on people that might have a viewpoint or perspective that they haven't heard before, and that makes for interesting content. And his platform got so big that... He talked about it. He was like, every single Democratic presidential candidate wants to come on my show. And the only ones he invited were Bernie, Tulsi, and Andrew Yang. Those are the only ones that he invited. Because, I mean, why not, right? Like, the, if you're going to invite presidential candidates, those are good ones to get. Uh... This also brings up the point of exclusivity, right? He, he becomes a lot more exclusive. Like, the people that get on his show, um, you know, he's he's now at that point where he can pick and choose who gets to be on his show rather than he has to bring people on his show because it's going to give them a boost. Like, I remember when Mark Marin got Barack Obama on his show, I, and it was a softball fucking conversation because, of course, it was a softball fucking conversation. Um, but... Like, that boosted Marin to the point where he was... He, he could get whoever he wanted after that. So... But Greenwald points this out. His views are, are basic liberal viewpoints. That's what Joe Rogan believes. It, they're basic liberal viewpoints, right? Like, we have to take care of the poor... Uh, Less militarism, more drugs, like we should legalize all drugs. He's pro-choice, and he's pro-LGBTQ. Now, he has had some controversies in that that department, right? uh, He's talked about trans folks in sports, and uh, he has brought up uh, some concerns that he has with trans folks in sports, and he's not... He's, you know, he's not the most eloquent person sometimes, and, and you know, it, it, it comes off as anti-trans. It comes off as, like, he does not want them to participate in sports. But it opens up the conversation, right? The, the, it's, it's a definite conversation that needs to be had because this is something new and different. Um, and I mentioned this before with, with, the, with the Joe Rogan controversies, too, is when, when people bring this up, um, is, uh, you know, that... that it comes off trans exclusionary for sure. When you say that trans people, what are we going to do with trans people in sports? And that is a conversation that should be had Uh, rather than, you know, what are we going to do with trans people in sports? The conversation should be, in my opinion, how are we going to include trans people in sports? How are we going to make this, you know, how are we going to include them into our thing? How are we going to make things more inclusive for them? That's, really the conversation, in my opinion. Um, And you can answer some of the questions that Joe Rogan brings up. But yeah, I think the way that he frames it, it comes off very trans-exclusionary. And I can see how people are pissed off about it. Um, I I mean, when I first heard it, I was like, ooh, this is not an awesome take uh, on this whole thing. And here's the deal. like, This pandemic might be the time to have that conversation about how do we include trans people in sports? Um, you know, especially if there's an athlete that has transitioned, uh, how do we respectfully take their record and, and, and do the, like, how do we apply the record, uh, to, to the world of sports? I don't know. I'm not a big sports guy. Uh, it's, it's particularly not a subject that I'm 
thought about until it was it was brought up by uh, by Joe Brogan, uh, the bro of all bros. Uh, but now that now that the conversation's out there, let's think about it, right? And, and I, I'm not again, I'm not I'm not a big sports person. I don't know a lot about the topic. Uh, I would have to do a lot more research for me to adequately talk about it uh, in the way that I would want to fucking talk about it. So, but here's the thing, right? So liberals kind of get on his case, even though he's very pro LGBTQ. Um, other, you know, other than other than the the sports thing, like Rogan still advocates for for protection and equality. Liberals see Kamala Harris as this like big champion, right? Uh, oh man, she's gonna balance out Joe Biden and his fucking dementia, racism, word vomit, and but she's had a mixed bag record with the LGBT community at best. Like she was not for gay marriage until two thousand nine, well past the point. Like the whole country at that point was like, yeah, we should have had this a long fucking time ago. The fuck. That's why it's like whenever they're like, oh, they changed their stance because they're brave. No, they changed their stance because their voters were like, yo, if you don't stand by the gay community anymore, then I, will, I, I don't know if I'm, gonna, I'm not going to vote for you. So it's not because they had a change of heart or something. It's because they need voters. And it's because they need the gay community's money. They need those donations. And, uh, so, you know, so she had this mixed bag record and she, and she denied medical services to trans, uh, uh, prisoners. That's a big deal. Like, she literally, adv- like, she literally blocked trans prisoners from getting medical aid. She is fucking laughed about people on death row. Like, Joe Rogan isn't out there trying to actively stop trans people from participating in sports. He brought up a question. Did he bring it up in the best possible way? Fuck no. He brought it up in a Joe Rogan way. Now, since then, the Harris camp, and I think Kamala Harris herself has come out and, like, apologized. Uh, And that's nice, but, like, what have you done about it? Like she was like, I'm taking all responsibility for what my uh, offices did, and da 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 da. And it's like, that's that's great. Now what? What are you putting protection bills forward? Are you working for criminal justice reforms? Because you can make the statement, you can say I'm taking responsibility, but if you're not going to do anything, if you're not going to put actions behind your words, then what is the point? Like then it just becomes we're we're back to platitudes again, which is something that the Democrats and the liberals fucking love to do. This is the point where you go, yeah, I'm taking responsibility, and here are some actions. Here are some things that I'm thinking about putting forward, and I'm going to work with, uh, uh, in Congress. I'm going to work on the ground with people to elevate trans people to. You know, ensure that we give prisoners the rights that they need. We're not. I'm not going to give into this prison industrial. But no, she's just like, no, we need prisons, and you have to have locks on your doors because everybody's going to kill you all the time. Uh, but don't be racist. And that's like, and this is like, no, but your system is racist. Now, this is the uh, the other thing that people kind of get shitty on Joe Rogan about, right? Is he talks to people from the far right. And he does talk to people from the far right. And I've listened to his conversations with people that are deemed far right. Uh, and that are far right. Like Ben Shapiro's far right. I've listened to I've listened to two or three episodes that he's done with Ben Shapiro. Uh, and some of them are fucking crazy. Because uh, Ben Shapiro is a weird little dude. And there are, there are times where it's like... Like he, like Joe Rogan is trying to push him, and he, and he's like, he just doesn't get it that Joe, like Joe Rogan walked him into a trap, and he doesn't get that he's walked himself into a trap. It's crazy, but it's. I think this is important because now you know how the other side thinks. Now you know what the other side is saying. And the thing with Joe Rogan, too, is that sometimes his belief systems waxes and wanes based on the guest. Uh, you know, like, all of a sudden he's kind of 
siding with the... And maybe it's just to kind of let them... To, to be like, okay, I think I understand where you're coming from, what your perspective is. Please go on. Please continue. That sort of a thing, right? Um, it might be that. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I, I genuinely can't be sure about that. Uh, but I, for one, like, it was one of those things where I was like, cool, now I know what's going on with the other side. Now I know what I'm what I'm arguing against and how how my beliefs fit into that argument. How how my beliefs can be argued and debated. Why why I believe in what I believe in. Now the, the other crazy part too is like the Democratic Party is going after conservatives in the far right. Liberals are going after them. That's who they want. They want them to vote. The Democratic Party needs their vote. The Democratic Party 100% needs the conservatives vote because if the conservatives vote for their for, for, for their Republican, then they won't go for the actual Republican. They cater to them over the progress. They hate they fucking hate the progressives. They demonize the progressives all the time. They do this McCarthyist bullshit all the time. They they participate in demonizing the word socialism just as much as Republicans do. Look, the the Democrats saw this huge movement, this this like resurgency of the labor movement and the civil rights movement all at the same time with the Black Lives Matter, with all of these strikes that we've seen against the Amazon and all that stuff, right? (laughs) And (laughs) it boggles the mind, man. It boggles the mind. You know, it, it, it really does because there's a whole movement about, like, defunding the police and what that means and why they want more community driven efforts, why they want more uh, funding allocated to social services, mental health programs. You know why? Why are guys with guns being called for nonviolent uh, domestic problems? You know these should be counselors coming in, unless there's somebody's brandishing a gun or a weapon. You don't really need cops there. And they've taken this idea and they've run with it in the Republican thing, right? The Republicans are are, are attacking them. They're like, oh, the Democrats believe in defunding the police and letting. All of these people run amok all over the streets and people are just going to be setting things on fire and pulling their dicks out and masturbating on your cars and they're going to be jacking it on your retirement accounts. Retirement jackers. That's what the defund the police move. Like that's what the de- the Republicans have made the, this movement out to be. And the Democrats basically, instead of having the conversation with progressives to be like, what does this movement mean? How can we be a part of it? How can we help? How can we take legislative action they're like we will not defund the police in fact we need to put more money into the into cops to teach them and train them how not to murder civilians yeah because that needs training i'm not murdering civilians right now i've never been trained not to do that i just know not to do that they blatantly i i watch these fucking political commercials every day because they take care of this old lady in the evenings. They play about 28 million of them. Connor Lamb is like, I am not going to defund the police. And I'm like, well, then I don't want to vote for fucking either of you. Like, that, so, you know, and then he picks a cop. Joe Biden's vice president is a cop. Kamala Harris is a cop. And he fucking picked a vice president that is a cop. Who does that cater to? The defund the police movement does not cater to conservatives and them saying like we don't support this movement and we never will even though the entire country is clamoring for it at this point because police brutality has become a major issue that is now it, it's it's like upwinded and surrounded you know because defunding the police will eventually lead to defunding the military and it talks about fascism at home not only that but the blue leaks have revealed that cops side and line up with uh White supremacist organizations. We've seen that time and time again. I wrote a show about it. They go after black... Like, Black Lives Matter protesters are tracked more 
than white supremacist organizations and the Boogaloo Boys who outright on social media will talk about killing cops. The Democrats are trying to fucking cater because they know what what the what, what Republican voters are looking for. So they're going to they're going to put their candidate to that side. You should know how the other side thinks and what the other side thinks. You should know why you believe in what you believe in. That's key. And you should know how to defend those beliefs. I mean, this is all part of critical thinking. The other part of this too is is when liberals go on uh, conservative networks, they're like praised for it, right? Like Obama goes on Fox News, or Bernie goes on Fox News, or any of the any of these politicians, these these like bigger uh, Democrats they go on Fox News and they're like oh look at them reaching across the when it's people that they like when it's the people that the establishment likes by the way it's not everybody when Tulsi Gabbard goes on Fox News because CNN will never invite her uh, but they'll smear her all day long uh, when when she goes on Fox News she's smeared for it she's oh she's a right wing looney tune you know she's she's a Republican in hiding blah 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 and it's like CNN won't have her on the show but Barack Obama goes on Fox News. Oh, look at him reaching across the aisle. He's being a good guy. He's being a good guy. This is what politics is about. It's about rich conservatives and rich liberals coming over to fuck everybody that's poor. Reaching across the aisle. What a, what a nice guy. Which brings to the final point of this that um, Greenwald points out in this article is that the liberal elites don't like him because Joe Biden is a comedian. He is crass. Uh, He is not the most eloquently spoken individual. He swears. He's not what they want liberal elites to look like. He's not the embodiment of the coastal elite. You know, he doesn't look like someone that has uh, gone to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or any of these fucking schools. Someone that's on Wall Street, you know, this buttoned up fucking, I will use a bunch of SAT words that I've memorized and uh, that is how I will speak. I will speak in a... In a, in a somewhat mild British accent. It's not a heavy or a thick British accent. This is a mild one. He doesn't look like them. He doesn't talk like them. Again, same reason why a lot of elites don't like Donald Trump. He is not the, the visual embodiment of what they want rich people to look like. They want rich people to look like Barack Obama. They want rich people, well, to be more accurate, they want rich people to look like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, right? White dudes, that's what they want. And Nancy Pelosi. Dude, this guy just got $100 million to switch over his whole podcast from YouTube to Spotify, which I've had my issues with Spotify, and I've, and I've gone on about it plenty of times on, uh, on this channel, so I'm not going to keep doing it again. But... You know, this guy's got money now. I mean, he's he's vastly wealthy. He's doing really good for himself. He's not a coastal liberal. He's not a typical coastal liberal. So you like him. Even though he's got pretty much the same values as the liberals do. Almost all of them. My personal view on Joe Rogan is uh, he's fine. There's It's hit or miss. I don't listen to him a whole lot anymore because I don't do a lot of driving anymore. Um, you know, usually when I was uh, on tour going, you know, five, six hour drives and stuff. Uh, yeah, I would, I would, you know, do a road reflection. I would listen to my set. I would listen to some Joe Rogan. I would listen to some other podcasts. I would listen to some music. I, I had the time to do it. Um, you know, you spend that time in the car. Uh, and I always thought he was fine. 
sometimes he asks better questions than most people in, in mainstream media. And, and you know, the, 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 what really showcases, like, who Joe Rogan is um, comes off in the fact that people wanted him to moderate the debates. They wanted him to moderate the debates because he because they knew that he would even though he was like he's not the rich guy that people want but he he would have done a better job he would have been able to you know keep them on time it would have been more interesting and fascinating he would have he would have let them each like he sometimes has a he reigns it I mean I listen to this fucking guy talk to Alex Jones for five hours you know what I'm saying like this guy can rein in Alex Jones I think he can rein in uh, two old men fighting over soup, as Kit Cabello put it, from Hard Lens Media put it. It's just, it's so stupid to me. He's a comedian, and I think we should take him for what he's, what that is, right? Uh, he, he's going to be hit or miss. But liberals don't like him because, you know, he's not the rich guy that they want. That's not what rich people are supposed to look like. Uh, the last story is uh, is a Tulsi Gabbard story. I haven't done a Tulsi story in quite some time. Uh, some of you might know that, uh, t- t- you know, I, I was I was a little I was a little upset with Tulsi, uh, right? And I feel rightfully so. I <laughs> well, the reason I was upset with Tulsi, and I and I and I did talk about it back in March, is <laughs> because I was an avid supporter of Tulsi Gabbard, and I met her. She was very nice, very genuine person. But then she goes and and endorses Joe Biden, a, a individual that has uh, the opposite belief systems that she does, and it was mind boggling and very confusing. Um. So, you know, with that in mind, I was very upset and I got to that point and I, and I think Graham Elwood talked about this as well is, look, I, I don't think we should hinge everything on a political candidate, regardless of who that political candidate is. A lot of people uh, were, were, you know, everything hinged on, on Bernie Sanders. Um, and again, it's like, okay, that, that, that can be fine. But, um, but it doesn't, but no, like don't, don't let it hinge on that. It doesn't need to hinge on that one particular person. And that's kind of what I realized with Tulsi. I'm going to support the ideas. I'm going to support the, the movements, the people behind everything. But, you know, hinging everything on one political candidate seems a little irresponsible to me. Uh, but, you know, Tulsi's, Tulsi's back in the news. She's, she's putting out some, some bills. Uh, I, I honestly don't know what she'd been doing during the COVID. I think she, she said she was kind of trying to be in Hawaii for it to, like, help Hawaii. Uh, and that's cool. That's fine. But uh, anyway, uh, she put out th- th- three bills. Three bills. Uh, basically going against the Espionage Act and what what we're doing to Julian Assange, what, what the United States of America is doing to, uh, to Julian Assange here. And, um, you know, the, the first portion of the bill is to pardon Edward Snowden, pardon and drop all charges on Edward Snowden. Um, so that's the first part of the bill. Uh, and that's, yeah, I a hundred percent agree with that. Uh, even the courts agree with that. Like, there's a bunch of courts that were like, yeah, what the NSA did and what the NSA was doing was 100% unconstitutional. And, uh, you know, so for her to for her to come out and, and make this bill is is huge. And she's got Republican support on, on this stuff, too, by the way. There are Republicans supporting this stuff. There are Repo- Republicans coming out and saying, OK, yeah, we'll back this thing. Huge. That's very large. That's very big. Uh, second one, along the same lines here, um, 
pardon and drop all charges to Julian Assange. And again, not yet, yeah, duh, fucking, let's do it. I, I look, at this point, I feel like anybody that comes out, in the, especially if you're in the government, and you come out and you're like, hey, we, you know, J- J- Julian Assange is a bad guy and blah, 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 and we have to keep him in prison and so on and so forth. You're, you're basically now, if you come out against Julian Assange, you, you are now an advocate for uh, torturing innocent people and fascism. That's what you're for. Because Julian Assange is being tortured. You know, Melzer has talked about it. it. You know, I've brought up that. Taylor Hudak has brought up that. The Action for Assange folks have brought this fact up. Dude's being tortured. He's a, he's a suicide risk. And she points out, Tulsi points out in the video that what um, what Snowden and Assange did was for the public interest, for for the public good. Uh, that's why they reveal the information that they revealed, and um, and that's why they should be they should be praised for it. So, uh, you know, I, I I'm I'm all for that. I think it's great. The last part, this is where probably where I'll veer away from Tulsi a little bit. Um, the last part talks about reforming the Espionage Act. Uh, Basically saying that people that reveal information, whistleblowers, will be protected, uh, have the right to be protected if the government decides to take action against them. And that's nice, uh, but why not just abolish the Espionage Act altogether to, to stop protecting people in the government? You know, why are we protecting war criminals? If you, if if somebody reveals that you're committing a war crime, if somebody reveals that you're committing corporate fraud, you're completely fucking over the middle class. You shouldn't be able to use this law. This law shouldn't even be in place. Period. Outdated, paranoid, old law. And you have, she brings up Daniel, Daniel Ellsberg, um, with good reason to bring up Daniel Ellsberg, right? Uh, he, he was one of the first people to be, well, she says he, he was one of the first people to be put, uh, locked up by the Espionage Act. And that is partly true. I think he's the first, um, person of journalistic merit to be locked up by the Espionage Act, but I don't think he's the first person. You had Eugene Debs, you had Schenck, you had a lot of anti-war socialists and activists that were uh, uh, locked up because of the Espionage Act. So he's technically not the first person, but Daniel Ellsberg was the first, somebody in a journalistic capacity <clears throat> that was almost locked up. He was pr- prosecuted for it. I say abolish this motherfucking bill. That's what I say. That's what I think needs to happen with it. Uh, the big question is, what's going to happen? I mean, these, this, it's on the floor. It's got Republican, a couple Republicans backing it. Um, is is that enough? Is that enough? You know, will it go through? Will some? Will, will we get a pardoning? You have a bunch of Republicans and Democrats vehemently against this idea. At least she's putting something forward. And, you know, if it gets declined, it'll get declined by the merits of Democrats not getting behind a Democrat. And Republicans not backing Republican backers. The question I have is where's the squad on this, right? Where's AOC and Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib? Uh, I don't, again, my, my relationship is that I don't, I don't hate these people. I'm not, I'm not going to hate these people. I, but I'm not going to hinge everything that I have on these people. But I want to know where are the rest of the Democrats? Where's Pelosi? Where's, uh, where's Bernie? Bernie hasn't said anything about Assange, which is very disappointing. Where's Joe, where's Joe Biden and Kamala Harris on this? 
Where are they at? I don't know where this bill is going to go, if you want my honest opinion. Um, I, I feel like this bill is probably going to stay stagnant. Uh, we may never hear of it again. Because, like, in March, early whenever we were doing lockdown procedures and everything, she put something out for a UBI. And, you know, like, everybody just kind of ignored it until Ilhan Omar started tweeting about a UBI. That's kind of what I think is going to happen with this. Um, I would hope not. I would hope that they actually take this thing seriously and do something about it and do pardon Assange and do pardon Snowden and realize that that is the right thing to do. And what's happening with Julian Assange is actually quite dangerous and uh, and completely fucked and a, and a show trial and is a violation of, of, of human rights on, on major levels, which will then make us look at what the CIA has to say, which will then make us look at how the, Amer- uh, how, how the uh, American military industrial complex gets to act. But all of these things that I just listed is why somebody like Nancy Pelosi or Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Mitch McConnell, uh, fucking Lindsey Graham, none of them will fucking go for this. But good on Tulsi for trying. All right, folks, I think that's it. I know that ended on a little bit of a bleak note, but, uh, um, you know, sometimes it ends on a bleak note. Uh, thank you guys for tuning into this and, and checking it out. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to try to do a couple more of these. I might try to go live uh, a, a couple more times once I figure out how to set up my... Uh, my home studio office situation. If not, I'll, I'll probably do a couple more uh, more of these throughout the weeks. Might go back to how I was doing it before, which is uh, do a bunch of research on some articles and and then drive around and talk about it. Uh, it you know, release them in the evenings, things, something like that. Um, yeah, it'll depend on how much energy I have and how much decompression I need to take from from just nonstop work. Uh, yeah, so. I appreciate you guys being patient. I appreciate all the people that bought tickets that come out to see the virtual shows and have become sustaining members and made donations and all that kind of stuff. You guys are pretty awesome. Um, Again, if you want to make a donation, if you you can make a donation or can become a sustaining member, uh, go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, sustaining memberships is going to be a big way that I'll be able to earn my income since I'm not touring. Uh, so, you know, if you guys have the ability to, to become sustaining members, awesome. Uh, I'm going to be updating my Patreon, uh, and, uh, doing a, doing a, you know, sprucing up my website and all that kind of stuff pretty soon here. So, uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, all right, folks. Uh, we'll, we'll probably see you tomorrow. Thanks so much.